So, to begin with, you know, let's give another round of applause to two ladies in here who have done an absolutely fabulous job with two organizations that have made a significant difference in our city. Pauline Moffitt of Indy Fringe and Ellen Bunn. <laughs> And incidentally, since this is a travel show, it's not Carmel. It's not our seat. Okay, I was hoping that people knew that. Yeah, this is good. Well, let's see now. So Ian talks about Australia. Um, let's see now. Murda talks about the wonderful trip she recently took to many interesting countries in Africa. Samantha talks about her trip to England, and what am I going to talk about? Katrina and I's visit to a bunch of libraries here in the U.S. So if you want to leave now, <laughs> you can do so, but that's the topic, libraries. So we happen to be in West Branch, Iowa. Now, how many of you all have been to West Branch, Iowa? I feel sorry for the rest of you because you have missed wonderful opportunities. Katrina, raise your hand. I You've did. been there. <laughs> yeah, you've been there too. Herbert Hoover. And Aussie has been there. That's right. Herbert Hoover. What is there? You're right. Is the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. And it's interesting that an Aussie would have known that. And I would guess that nobody else in here knew it. We What's didn't know it before we went there. So anyway, so we're in West Branch. And I'm really excited that we have seen the Herbert Hoover Library. And we're on a little hill there overlooking a scenic town. And it's in the fall. And the, and the trees are turning. And I'm still kind of a, in a state of euphoria, having gone through the library. I don't know how many of y'all can experience that going to the library. But I did. And all of a sudden, Katrina breaks my revelry and says, how many more of these presidential libraries do you have to visit? I said, there's only one left. And she says, which one is that? I said, Eisenhower. She said, now, where's that located? I said, I think that's in Abilene, Kansas. She said, how far is that from here? And I said, well, I think around 400 to 450 miles. And she says, let's go and get it over with. Yeah. <laughs> let's go and get it over with now. <laughs> so we travel through the great state of Iowa, which incidentally is very interesting. There's some interesting things in, in uh, Iowa. So we travel through there and go to the Eisenhower Museum, which is the last one of the 12 official presidential libraries, and we have none left to visit until the Bush Library is finished in Dallas. And I can't wait for that. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll find something else to do to keep us busy. But anyway, but the presidential libraries are really interesting places. Not only do they tell us about significant times in our history, and the most important person in the world at that time, and the, and the things and the events that surrounded that him, I can say him because they're all males up to this point. And for example, we're, we're in the Eisenhower Library, and, and there are always interesting things in all of them. One of the interesting things is this. Eisenhower, during his eight years in office, had one vice president. You know who he was? Nixon, that's right. Yes. How many photos, or how often, his name was mentioned throughout, there's always a movie shown in the visitor center of all the libraries, and then you go through the museum. Now, he had the same VP for eight years, as I mentioned. Guess how many times Nixon's name is mentioned or his picture is shown throughout the entire museum? One time. And toward the end, there's that famous picture of him with Khrushchev in the so-called kitchen, kitchen debate, yes. You got it. And you weren't even alive then. <laughs> so your mother told you about it. Are you ready? Okay. Or you've been in our library. But anyway, that is the only picture. So that, that's kind of interesting. 
But it is a beautiful campus, and of course the main picture or sculpture of the president is in each place. For him, he's dressed in his uniform, and that's the remembrance. Now, uh, another interesting library visit we had was the Reagan Library. How many of y'all have been to the Reagan Library in the Simi Valley, overlooking the beautiful valley, and we, we arrived there about sunset, and we were at his grave site, and we can see why he fell in love with that site, and that's where he's buried. It was just a beautiful scene. The sculpture of him, that's the main presidential piece, is of him on a horse in a western outfit. And he looks great. And you probably already knew that too, didn't you? Okay. And that is the, and that is the only and that is the only library where there is a full presidential Air Force One jet in the library. It's the one he used for the eight years that he was there. And right down the road from the Eisenhower Library is the Nixon Library. Now. And this was about five years ago we were there. And it's before it was taken over by the National Archives Administration. It was when it was operated by the friends of, of Dick Nixon, actually operated it. And at the time, the, uh, his papers were not yet turned over to the government. By special arrangement, they took maybe 15 or 20 years for that to happen. In any event, so just out of curiosity, I went through the Watergate section and listened to the tapes and read the material that they had. And, I can't, and it was an article in the Star recently about this particular, uh, about that incident, not the incident of our looking through the library, but the existence of the Watergate section. If you would go through the Watergate section at that time, you would have concluded that Watergate was nothing but a couple of overzealous Washington Post reporters who used illegal means to uncover uh, information that was very... Uh, unimportant and probably incorrect and that Nixon took the fall for two of his people and was guilty of nothing. That is exactly what you would have concluded by going through the library. And when I came back to Indianapolis, I went on the internet just to listen to a couple of things to remind me that he really was guilty of something. <laughs> but you would never know it. And I read in the Star about a year ago where when it was taken over by the National Archives Administration, they went in and threw it all out and now have the actual facts in there. But it was kind of interesting because in some cases, and you would expect that a library devoted to a particular person would tend to, to speak highly of that particular person, but not to the point where it would be not factual. But in this case, uh, it was not. And let's see, oh, something I wanted to mention, whenever Murdoch began her presentation, she mentioned that her trip included a country called Bhutan. Now that was an interesting country. And I'll have to say that, that a lot of times the places that Katrina and I decide to visit come about in many ways. We, we might read an article. In fact, many of the articles that Murda has written for the Indianapolis Star have motivated me to visit those places, including exotic places, but also places as unexotic as Memphis. You had written an article about, and we absolutely loved visiting Memphis. And I brought the article with me and went through it and visited all the places. Now, so Bhutan, though, came about as a result of reading an article in Indianapolis one day. And the article began this way. It said that there's some, they were talking about some cultural phenomenon. And they said that certainly you are aware of this particular cultural phenomenon unless you've been living in Bhutan for the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and when I read that, I'm thinking if Bhutan is equated with being totally out of touch with civilization, <coughs> I want to go there. Yeah. So we did. Six months later, we went to Bhutan, Tibet, and Nepal. And all were very, very interesting. Now, Bhutan just got television and the internet in the, 90, in the late 90s, can you believe? And it is so pristine. I like to compare uh, people in Bhutan to animals in the Galapagos. They're pristine, unfettered, or uninfluenced by the outside world for years. 
When we went there and we mentioned to see, we try to mix with the locals as much as possible and try to travel on our own. Although there you need a guide. They want to keep it pristine and they limit the number of people who can attend. So we were talking with this one guy and interpreting through someone and we said that we were from Indiana. The guy said, I know where Indiana is. And that really made me feel good because seldom in our touch places do people know where Indiana is. But this guy knew. And he said, that's between Los Angeles and New York. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have expected me with that. I said, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's that vast wasteland between the coast. <laughs> but they do have something very interesting there. The people are very poor. In fact, they got in, in there. It's the only capital city. Was it Thim Thimpo? Timpu. Timpu. Timpu, that's right. It's the only one. The only uh, capital city in the world that has no, no stoplights. No, no stoplights. No stoplights. No stoplights. No stoplights. No stoplights. Wouldn't that be a nice place to go? You'd think maybe they got roundabout. Maybe Mayor Brainerd was there. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't even have that. But the one thing I want to mention about that is despite the fact they're very poor, the people are clearly happy people. And you wonder about it until we learn that they have bought into a concept known as G and H. You know what that stands for? Don't you say, because you already know. Yeah. That yeah. stands for? Yeah. Gross na uh, National Happiness. My God, this Aussie guy knows everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It's Gross National Happiness. So, and that's the concept that happiness comes from within and isn't dependent upon outside resources or money or possessions, which is great for a country that doesn't have it. So they're internally happy, which is kind of a neat concept to have. And maybe we're going toward that in this country as we become poor and poor and poor. But in any event, uh, Bhutan is a very interesting place to visit if you have it. But my main, and I just got sidetracked on that because Murray had mentioned it, but my main thing is to talk about the libraries, and I want to encourage you that if you haven't visited the libraries, to visit them, because very interesting experiences await you at our great, and the only things that, the, the other thing that we enjoy doing besides visiting the libraries are the national parks. And, what, and that is probably the best thing that our government ever did was to set aside those places. So in traveling, there are just so many wonderful opportunities of things to do and, and places to go and people to see. Thanks for listening.